I would very much like to, uh, for all of you to welcome Dr. Peter Fisher. Thank you very much, Birgitta. It's a great pleasure, a great honour to be here and to see so many people in Sweden that, uh, I have to say, traditionally has been something of a desert for homeopathy. Uh, <laughs> So I have, as usual, far too many slides, so it's going to be a bit of a rush. It's going to be a little bit impressionistic. I apologize for that in advance. Just to show you, this is our hospital. Um, it's in Queen Square. This is very central in London. It's about 300 meters from the British Museum. Just here is the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. It's the biggest center in the UK for ne uh, neuro neurology. Just behind us is the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, the biggest pediatric center in the UK. So we're right in the heart of medical London, although I have to say it's not always a very comfortable place to be because we have two bigger and richer neighbors and a very nice building, which they covered. Um, anyway, just to remind you, and excuse me for teaching you about just reminding you of some basics of homeopathy. The basic idea of homeopathy, of course, is like cures like, similia similibus curentur. Just to give you an example, a familiar example, common acute homeopathic medicine, belladonna. Belladonna in Italian, of course, means beautiful lady. Uh, and the reason it is called beautiful lady or belladonna is that at one time in the Renaissance, Italian ladies would express the, the, the juice from these berries and drop it in their eyes. It would give them dilated pupils, which is considered very sexy. They were sexy. They couldn't see where they were going, but they were very sexy. So. <laughs> um, and actually, atro atropa, is, atropa is one of the three fates, the three fates who in Greek mythology weave the fabric of men's lives, and Atropa was actually the one who cut the thread, ending men's lives. So, beautiful, deadly lady. Actually, one of, uh, one of the other fates was Lachesis, so two of the three fates are homeopathic remedies. Um, but I just show you this to remind you. So this, this is a signature. This black shiny berry does look remarkably like a dilated pupil. That is the signature of belladonna. But that is not homeopathy. Homeopathy is based, uh, the doctrine of signatures is a very poetic idea, a very beautiful idea, but it is not homeopathy. Homeopathy is about pathophysiological sim similarity. So, you know, it, atropine causes heart, uh, rapid heart rate, hot, dry skin, flush face, it decreased secretions. And we use it for very similar things in homeopathy. And it's very important to remember, homeopathy is about similarity, not about metaphor. And very important, if we're going to research it successfully, we must remember that. Just a couple of, of definitions that will be familiar to people, anybody who is in public health. Efficacy, meaning how well does the treatment work in ideal conditions. Effectiveness, how well does it work in, in the real world. And these can be very different things. They can be very, very completely different, actually. They sound similar, but ideal conditions means a randomized controlled trial in a university, short period, uh, carefully selected patients. The real world is very different. Longer periods, less carefully selected patients. Many, many differences. And then validity. There's three kinds of validity. And these will be familiar to anybody who knows anything about public health. Internal validity, is it, you know, is, the, is it a rigorous trial? External validity, is it applicable to the outside world? But one other area that has been little explored, we have recently published a paper, only just about a year ago, is model validity. And very important in homeopathic research, because some negative research papers are bad homeopathy. So model validity, put simply, is, is it good homeopathy? Or is it not good homeopathy? Or acupuncture or, or whatever, or indeed conventional medicine. But we have developed a method for assessing model validity in homeopathy, which has also been adopted by some other complementary medicine therapies. I will show you a little bit about that in a moment. So just a few of the questions which homeopathy raises, seven questions, a lot of questions. Um, and the ones we're going to focus on, we can't answer them all. We will focus on these ones, in, so that one we're going to forget completely. Uh, that lot. So these are the ones we're going to look at now. When I speak tomorrow, we will look at the basic scientific questions. But these research, of course, is really just a met method for answering questions. These are the questions we're going to look at really now. So one is the internal validity question, are the effects placebo or not placebo? And does it 
actually, is it worth using? Does it provide you know, uh, benefit in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness? Those are the two questions I will try to answer now. So this is a very infamous episode that happened in 2005. This was the paper published by uh, Shang et al. In fact, the, 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 the villain of the piece is Matthias Egger. Uh, Matthias Egger is a, a professor of epidemiology in the University of Bern in Switzerland, um, which claimed to show that homeopathy doesn't work but was a terrible, I mean, when you actually, well, I remember I was in my clinic, it was a hot Thursday afternoon, and the press release came through. And I first thought, oh no, this is trouble, this is bad. And the more I thought about it, this is ridiculous, it's outrageous, it's complete nonsense. More and more, the longer I thought about it, the more I realized it is complete nonsense. So let me show you why. So what they did was, they took 110 matched trials of homeopathy in conventional medicine, they matched them for indication for number of patients and so on. They then reduced that to 21 higher quality trials of homeopathy, 14 higher quality trials of conventional medicine. So the first thing to notice is, contrary to what is often said, the trials of homeopathy are better quality than those of conventional medicine. They are 50% more likely to be of high quality than in conventional medicine. They then reduced it to eight larger higher quality, eight of homeopathy, six conventional. Homeopathic trials tend to be smaller because of the difficulties of individualizing. And essentially said, homeopathy is a placebo effect. Now, this is outrageous for a whole lot of reasons. So this is, oh dear, something, something's going on here. So this shows you, as you can see, the plots are completely different. Oh no, I got them wrong. <laughs> That's right. Actually, you can see they're actually, to eyeball them, they're almost the same, except you have, for conventional medicine, you have a couple of, outliers, strongly positive outliers here, take those away, and they are virtually identical. In fact, the homeopathy ones are, if anything, more positive. Just to look at the 110 trials, it is obvious there is no big difference. What was most outrageous of all, though, in my view, was that the eight trials on which they based this conclusion, or the 14 trials, were completely anonymous. This, you know, it's only eight or 14 references, and what's more, the, the paper had a web appendix. They could have, if they didn't want to print it, they could have put it on the web. They didn't. And they refused to tell. When people emailed Egger and said, please, can you tell us which eight studies you're talking about? They refused. And what's more, you couldn't tell. I mean, if you're like me, you know the literature quite well. You knew how many patients, what was the, what was the diagnosis, you know, who was the first author. I would have known, you know, I and several other people would have known straight away which they were talking about. They took great care that you couldn't identify them. They didn't tell you the number of patients, they didn't tell you the diagnosis, they didn't tell you the first author, nothing. You couldn't, you really could not tell. Somebody had been very careful to be sure you couldn't tell. And so they excluded 93% of them. They dredged the data. Dredging, you may not be, it's a, it's a pejorative term in English. It means when, you're, when your river is too shallow, you dig up the mud from the bottom. So what they did, and this is a cardinal sin of data analysis, is they didn't like the result they got, as we'll see with, with, tw with the higher quality studies. So they looked for a smaller subset that gave them the result they wanted, so they added larger. But they added it post hoc. In other words, they looked at the result, oh, we don't like that result, let's look for another <laughs> set that gives us a result we do like. That is called data dredging, it is absolutely impermissible. And they did no sensitivity analysis, again, very important. You know, they gave you one result. What if you look at the data in a slightly different way? Does it give you a different result? They didn't say. And what's more, it didn't even imply with the quorum guidelines. These were the, the guidelines for meta-analyses published in the Lancet itself. Actually, they have now been superseded. The new guidelines are called PRISMA, but at the time, the guidelines were quorum. Didn't comply with those. So this is, you know, on every count. It's a ridiculous meta-analysis. Um, eventually, so there was a big lot of, this, it was published in August 2005, there was a lot of criticism in early December 2005, and then on Christmas Eve, 24th of December 2005, they finally published the eight studies. They told everybody which eight studies. So again, interesting timing. 24th of December, you can be sure, at least in, in Europe, nobody's going to be, everybody's going to be eating and drinking and not thinking about, you know, science. Uh, so then eventually they did, put, and there's rather polite conclusion, um, which actually they meant it's absolute rubbish. 
So this is to show you, this is, um, the, this is for Shang's uh, original studies. So actually for the 21 studies, it is positive. Anything below the line means it's positive. This looks as if it overlaps, but in fact it doesn't. The confidence intervals were below one. This is actually a positive result. It's actually positive from about 12 upwards here, all the way here. All these, if you have more than about 12 studies, it is positive. Um, and it is very sensitive to this one study. This one study makes a huge difference. Completely has the, by far the, the lowest p-value of any, any study. So, and then there are others also on, oops, and that is the study, that's me, <laughs> unfortunately. But this was a study, this is a study based on, you may be familiar, done in, in, in Norway, in Oslo, on the, Os on the Oslo Marathon, where they showed that people who got Arnica had less muscle stiffness and really sensationally ran the marathon on average eight minutes faster. And it's undetectable. So this was sensational. We felt we had to repeat it. But the Oslo study was small scale. It was 40-something. And if you look at 40-something volunteers, and if you look at the data in detail, you will see that the ones, on average, the ones who got placebo were older and heavier than the ones who got active. And uh, I'm not a marathon man runner myself. I'm not that stupid. But I, I'm sure that being older and being heavier predicts running marathons slowly. So there was a problem with the, with the randomization. This was a negative result. So, all right, it doesn't work for, for muscle stiffness in, in marathon running. Maybe we should have used Rustox. There is other research I will show you which shows that, marath that, that Arnica is effective in other situations post-operatively. Uh, so this is another way of looking at it. If you just say, okay, it doesn't work for Arnica, but we will include four other trials, the, in fact, the Riley um, eyesopathy trials, which for unaccountable reasons, for reasons which Shang has never explained were excluded, it's positive all the way across. You can easily, you know, with a little bit of sense, you can do other sensitivity analysis which show this to be a positive result. Uh, let's skip this here. Okay, so this is the other, another meta-analysis published in The Lancet in 1997 by Klaus Linde. And it is, the methodology is completely, it is completely transparent. Okay, so this is his main result. It is absolutely transparent. So here is the name of the first author. Here is the reference, which was printed. This is the number of patients. This is the internal validity score, two validity scores. This is the diagnosis. This is the treatment. This is the outcome measure. And this is the result. Everything is there. And you have the reference. If you don't believe it, you can go and read it for yourself. So the completely reverse, absolutely transparent. So this means that placebo is better. This means homeopathy is better. And as you can see, this is, so this is clearly positive. This one, for instance, shows a trend for homeopathy. There's a few showing a negative trend. There is not a single one that is clearly negative. Not one. More of the same. Uh, one of my, this is one of my studies here. As you can see, nearly all fall on the right-hand side of the line. In fact, the biggest single group is clearly positive. There's positive and positive trends, roughly similar, about 35% uh, uh, each. And then you can boil it down to a single result. The single result for all 89 studies is clearly positive. Odds ratio about two and a half. This is very clearly positive. This is a strongly positive result. And then you can do sensitivity. They did sensitivity analyses, different ways of looking at it. Any way you look at it, it is positive. And this bit I like particularly because this looks, homeopaths love to argue about what, kind is, what is the best kind of homeopathy. Uh, I've even seen fights. I actually once saw a fist fight on the, stay, on the, on the podium in the, in the Liga between two different groups of Indian homeopaths. Um, but this one shows there is no real difference. So this is high potency, this is medium potency, this is classical, this is clinical, this is eyes up, this is... They're all the same. <laughs> so all these arguments are a waste of breath. Um, uh, let's skip this one. So this was the conclusion, the headline conclusion, not compatible with the, with the hypothesis of the effects of all a placebo. What you will very often see is this one, this one is not quoted, but this one is. But this is the headline. So he said, not clearly efficacious for any single condition. I think we can argue about that, and we, we will in a minute. 
uh, further research warranted. But what we have recently discovered is actually the literature has never been fully searched. This is, I was an author of this and it was published in, in the journal Homeopathy in January of this year. A bit complicated, but we found that there are 30 studies which had been published by the time that Linda and Shang were published, which were not included. A considerable number of non-included studies. Just to show you, yeah, this is a bit complicated. But this is the number you need to know. And, so there's 193 uh, uh, randomized controlled trials published of homeopathy published in peer-reviewed journals. That's quite a large number, getting on nearly 200. And actually, it is a larger number than Lindy or Shang were aware of. It's, it's actually difficult to search the literature. So you have different kinds. I, I won't go into all of this, but this is placebo-controlled. This is other than placebo, so controlled against some kind of active treatment. This is individualized homeopathy. This is non-individualized homeopathy. Again, this is non-individualized and individualized. And then there's this issue I mentioned earlier, model validity. So this is, is it good homeopathy or is it not? Very important and difficult to measure because, of course, homeopaths don't agree and love to argue. Um, so these are the things we measured. So is this something that it might respond to homeopathy? Is it con consistent with homeopathic principles? The, perhaps the most important one, would the rationale for the intervention be supported by a significant group of homeopaths? And that, of course, means you have to have, when you do this, you have to have a panel, a broad panel of people who, who vote, you know, who represent different strands of opinion in homeopathy. Um, this is important. Uh, no, sorry, this is important. Is the main outcome measure capable of detecting change? Because there have been some studies, there was a notorious study of asthma, which said, oh, it's negative. But when you look closely at the results, what you realize is they had what's called a floor effect. That means to say the children had very, very mild asthma, and there was no room for improvement. Actually, they, they published it. In order to have a statistically significant improvement, they would have had to have a, a seven-point improvement, seven percent improvement, so their final result would have been over 100%. It's impossible. It is actually impossible to have a, a significant improvement because they, were so, you know, they had only very mild asthma and the method, measured, the measured, method they were using for measuring it couldn't have detected the difference. So this is important. And just to show you, these are some we, did a, we, lo we looked at, two studies we looked at, and I will show you the results uh, of the model validity. So this is low validity. This was a study of, of homeopathy for uh, warts in children. And basically, this group, this, there were eight of us scored it. We scored it low. So this is a low model validity. This is a study done by Iris Bell in fibromyalgia, which scored, couldn't have, couldn't have scored higher, very high model validity. I will show you this one in a moment, a bit more detail of this one. So then, look, we're still on, meta, on systematic reviews and meta-analyses, but what we looked at before was uh, systematic reviews, meta-analyses of homeopathy as a whole. This is focused on specific conditions. Um, so these are positive. Um, this is a Cochrane review. I was an author of this one. Um, several others. Even some by Professor Ernst, the notorious Professor Ernst. Um, these are some more positive ones. And the really strong evidence is here is particularly in hay fever, seasonal allergic rhinitis, and upper respiratory tract infections. This is where the evidence is really, is really positive. These are negative. Um, these actually are almost the same study. <laughs> it, was, it was Ernst slicing the salami very, very finely, because actually they're very similar studies. Um, but actually, in both this one and in this one, there are other meta-analyses that say, oh, we're not so sure. And insomnia, since here, in, in 2011, there was a positive randomized control trial. So again, this may be up for, for argument. And these are the ones that are, that are inconclusive. So here we have another one of Arnica by Lutke. Uh, and another one, there's one of Headache here, which is maybe. ADHD is an interesting area. We'll look at that in a bit of, in a moment. There's some interesting things to be said about that. 
Oh, let's skip that. Okay. Um, so this is the work of Jennifer Jacobs. This is a series of studies of homeopathy for diarrhea in children. They used, well, classical homeopathy, but with a limited, power, limited number of remedies, and actually they used mostly podophyllum. So this is a pilot study done in Managua, Nicaragua. This is another study also done in Managua. This was done in Kathmandu, Nepal. As you can see, they're all positive, but individually not statistically significant. Pooled, they are statistically significant. And this is rather a nice study. I like this. this is also in diarrhea, but in piglets. <laughs> this is non-human study. This, and this is actually an important thing for, at least for farmers. This is done in a good, uh, very good uh, university in the Netherlands, Wageningen. Um, and this is a large-scale, uh, randomized, placebo-controlled studies. And this is not lapdog veterinary homeopathy. The method of administration is uh, unusual. They sprayed it on the sow's vulvas. They didn't give it to them by mouth, they sprayed it on. So this is really industrial, industrial veterinary homeopathy. Large scale. And a very big difference. So the placebo had an incidence of diarrhea of 24%. Uh, the coli, the, this, is co this, is, this preparation is called coli 30K. It's a commercial preparation of several strains of Escherichia coli had 4%. Big, big difference. And this is important for, for several reasons, of course. Antibiotic use in veterinary medicine is generally banned in the European Union and is one of the major sources of, of antibiotic resistance. Um, and, of course, it's commercially important to pig farmers. Make, so. Nice study and large scale and can't really be a placebo effect. I mentioned earlier that we have some positive... Um, the results on Arnica. This is a study done by Claudia Witt's group at the Charité, uh, Charité University Medical Center in Berlin. Um, looking at Arnica, same, actually the same dilution of Arnica as we used in the running study in knee surgery. So there were three linked randomized control trials. So arthroscopy, knee replacement, and cruciate ligament repair. They looked at post-operative pain. And the results of the three pooled results were Point, were statistically significant. Note that they stopped, they constantly monitored the, the statistics. When they got past 0 0.05, they stopped the study. Uh, so they stopped it, well, as soon as they reached a significant result and broke the code. So only for cruciate ligament repair alone was it significant, but it looks actually as if the, the results were probably the same for all of them. They, they don't think that really the effect is different. Just to show you the result, so here, this is arthroscopy. So here you have a floor effect. So zero means there is no difference between uh, homeopathy and placebo. And you see there's, there's a floor effect, really. There's, they had very little pain. So there's not very much to scope for improvement. Uh, this is cruciate ligament repair. This is knee replacement. They're all on above zero, meaning uh, that they had less pain with arnica, uh, less pain and swelling. This is actually swelling. Uh, homeopathy versus conventional treatment in acute otitis media. This is a study recently published done in India. Um, and they had the collaborate, so this is a standard parent questionnaire. This is a standard uh, um, measure of inflammation done by an ENT specialist. And what they showed is a cure, 100% cure at with conventional, no, two children were not cured with homeopathy at 95, uh, uh, 21 days. But look at this, huge difference in antibiotic prescribing. And this is very important. All national guidelines, I'm sure in Sweden, say that you should not normally use antibiotics for acute otitis media in children. This is universally agreed, and yet it is done all the time. And it's a very bad thing, not only on the epidemiological level, not only does it increase antibiotic resistance in general, but it is bad for the children themselves. Children who get antibiotics have a greater tendency to get another attack of acute otitis media. And this is probably because when you give them antibiotics, you kill 95% of the bacteria, but the 5% that survive are the very nasty, virulent ones. So actually they have more, the more antibiotics, it's a, it's a slippery slope. It's a vicious cycle. Just to show you the, the result. Yeah. In fact, the, the homeopathic ones got better quicker. 
So this is homeopathy. They got by one week, more of them were better. There were a couple who didn't improve at all. But this is similar. So the homeopathy has very similar outcomes, but avo avoids antibiotics. So this, is, I think, is a very important theme for us to recognize. There is a huge amount of polypharmacy. Many, much too many drugs are prescribed, and they're causing big problems. We have an answer to that. Uh, that's the, uh, the remedies prescribed, mostly pulsatilla. And again, everybody you look at, all the studies of acute otitis media agree pulsatilla is the most uh, prescribed remedy. Strangely, no belladonna there. It's a little odd, but that's what they found. That's what they did. Another rather similar study done by Jennifer Jacobs, who did the, the diarrhea study. This is with eardrops, actually with in a 30C, and showing again rather similar pattern. Uh, so more rapid improvement. This is the homeopathy, the one or two who, who hadn't resolved at the end. So similar pattern, actually. And this is what it contains. This one does have belladonna in it. And another one, so we now have quite a pattern. This is another study. This is done actually at the same place as Shang, who did the meta-analysis, University of Bern, but a different group. I don't think they talk to each other very much. Uh, this is done by Heiner Frey and Andrew Thurnison. There's a unit called KICOM at the University of Bern in Switzerland. I need to stop soon, don't I? Yeah. So, so basically, what they, they, looked, they took 230 children with uh, acute otitis media, and they treated them with, home, with homeopathy. If they did, weren't pain-free in six hours, they got a second homeopathic prescription. If not pain-free at 12 hours, an antibiotic. So over 70% were pain-free at 12 hours. And the rest got antibiotics. And this is about twice as fast. So this was an uncontrolled study. There was no comparator group. But the resolution, pain-free in 12 hours, is about two and a half times faster than you would expect on the basis of, of other published studies. Oh, I think we're going to just jump. That's very interesting, but... Okay, so ADHD. We mentioned ADHD is an interesting area. This is a study uh, also done by uh, Fry and Thurnison in Switzerland on hyperactivity. So this is uh, attention disorder hyperactivity... Uh, attention, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, according to the dsm 4 typical group of children. Um, but the, uh, the, the design is unusual. This is not a design of treatment. This is not a study of treatment. It's a study of stopping treatment. So what they did is they found the, the best. They got them to respond. OK, they, they gave them various, well, they, they had to try three times on average to find the right remedy. It's not easy to find the right remedy. But when they had found the right remedy, and which they did for 62 out of the 83, they entered them in the trial. Those who didn't respond, they dropped. The ones they couldn't find the right remedy for, they dropped. And then they gave them the remedy and placebo in random sequence. So crossover, sometimes remedy, sometimes remedy. And they, basically, they were better on placebo, or on, sorry, on Verum, on the treatment, than on placebo. And long term, they've got a big, this is a big improvement, 63% improvement. But an unusual design is not a, strictly speaking, it is not a design of treatment. It is it, not a study of treatment. It's a t study of stopping treatment. This is a rather similar, looks to be a similar study. I won't go into the details, but it looks superficially very similar, done again by Jennifer Jacobs, um, but with a negative result. So it looks superficially similar, but actually it's very different, just to show you the differences. So, this is the Fry study, this is the Swiss study, the positive study, fairly typical group of homeopathic medicines. This is Jacob's study, and this was done using, not using classical homeopathy, this is uses the sensation method, the Sankaran method. So that is an issue, in my view, a big issue. And only one in common in the top six. Only one major remedy. This is sugar, common sugar. So this is, for me, an odd selection of remedies. But this is not the crucial difference. This is the crucial difference. They took them three attempts to get the remedy right. And if, J if Fry had randomized after the first remedy, they would also have got a negative result. They've published it. If they, you say it's not easy to get the right remedy. In fact, Fry now says, 
that he uses polarity analysis, and it's no longer 3, it's now 1.5, if you add polarity analysis, but anyway. Or, but of course, other people, the French, use dopamine and serotonin uh, for ADHD. I don't know of any studies of that. Um, this is again for, I just, oh, I think we have to jump over, we just don't have enough time. Um, sorry, <laughs> there's lots to be said. Um, oh, this is a study in, done in Italy by Elio Rossi, taking, they just, they had a homeopathic clinic, and they just took data uh, from the central uh, state health registry, and they showed, sorry, these stars are all over, I don't know what's happened to the stars here, but basically they showed, in asthma, so they showed that specific, this means asthma inhalers, was reduced by, uh, the costs were reduced by 71% in the first year, another 54% in the second year. In the control of the group that didn't have homeopathy, they went up. And these are the general medicaid, this is the treatment for other, other conditions. So this is the asthma inhalers, this is their blood pressure medication or whatever, other medication. Both went down in the homeopathy group in both years, both went up in the... Um, in the uh, non-homeopathy group, compared to the year before starting treatment. And they, they, didn't, they just took this data from the, the central government records. This is the um, recently published thing from the uh, Health Technology Assessment commissioned by the Swiss federal government, looking at homeopathy for upper respiratory tract infections and allergies. This is just to show you the distribution of the different studies. Right, allergic rhinitis, flu. So the main ones are allergic rhinitis, flu, upper respiratory tract infection, some in asthma, otitis media. Some of them we've looked at other small areas. Types of homeopathy, more individualized, complex clinical, so individualized, complex clinical, and isopathy. Um, homeopathy... The, the results were comparable to standard treatment, with one exception, which was penicillin versus homeopathy for streptococcal tonsillitis. Rather brave study to do. I'm surprised they even got ethical approval for that. But I wouldn't, you know. Antibiotics are wonderful drugs when they're properly used, and penicillin for streptococcal infections is a proper use. Uh, eight out of 16 showed st statistically significant results versus placebo. Another four showed a trend, so 12 out of 16 were basically favorable for homeopathy, for no advantage. So that's similar to the results we saw with, with, with Linda. It's com compatible with that. So this was their overall conclusion. 24 out of 29 trials are positive. Probable effectiveness. And they had a three-point scale, which is probable, possible, not effective. And so probable is the most positive r they could have done. They could have probable, positive, not in, not effective, and they said probable. So this was the, the best of the three ratings. And as a result of that, homeopathy is now included in the Swiss compulsory national health insurance, following this, this report. Perhaps, have I got time just to, I've just, to, to uh, sorry, let me just do, let me just quickly show you this. This is a study done in France. Um, in, you, you can do this in France because you have a large number of, of general practitioners who publish homeopathy, who practice homeopathy. So they compared conventional mixed practice and homeopathic GPs for patients with musculoskeletal disorders. And this is, this you find in almost every study, the problem with this is not a randomized study. You, you, you're comparing people who choose to use homeopathy with people who don't choose to use homeopathy. And the problem with that kind of study is wherever you do it, whenever you do it, you find two things. And this is one of them. People who choose homeopathy are more educated than people who do not. So that's very comforting. Also, they have healthier lifestyles. They're less likely to smoke, less, less li more likely to take regular exercise, to have healthy diets. And this is a pro I mean, it's good, obviously, but it is a problem from the point of view of trial design because they're not the same people. Um, so basically, what they showed was that the, the clinical progression was the same, but many less non-steroidal drugs prescribed by the homeopathic doctors. And this is very important. They're, they're actually very dangerous drugs. So basically, much less non-steroidal use. And that's just to show it to you. So this is, this is acute 
And this is chronic, as you can see, roughly half. The, the homeopathic doctors are prescribing half as much of these you know, dangerous drugs for the same result. And I think I have to stop there. Yeah, that's the summary. Sorry, I've overrun my time. Thank you very much. Right, and, and question time. Five minutes question time. So please uh, take the opportunity to ask questions. So after each speaker, we will have five minutes question time. So um, write them down during the speech So and take the opportunity. I'd just like to uh, make a comment. Mm. Some of the abbreviations of the diseases in English, it's very difficult for us to understand. Sorry, yes. For me. So ADHD is attention, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as defined by DSM-4, which is a the standard American diagnostic manual. AOM, acute otitis media, URTI, upper respiratory tract infections. What others were there? I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, URTI, upper respiratory. Uh, uh, oh, MSD, oh, musculoskeletal disorders. Sorry. Sorry, can we come, uh, come over and, and give you the microphone? Please stand up. How is the situation for homeopathy in England? Oh, quite difficult. Uh, we have. A strong attack. In fact, for, uh, we have a lot of attacks from so-called skeptics who have a, really have a witch-hunting mentality, who insist there is no evidence, which is, which is quite untrue. We have a, quite a, a difficult situation, but they're actually a small minority um, with very strange political motivations, actually. They were ex-Trotskyites. They were Trotskyites who suddenly became right-wing libertarians. It's completely strange, but they, they are behind this attack. And actually, we have a lot of broad support. Uh, fortunately, we live in a democracy, and every time there is a really big attack, then we actually we have strong support in Parliament. So it's, it's not easy, but uh, we're surviving. <laughs> we have time for more questions. Uh, you said something about um, when you're treating with uh, antibiotics. Uh, a lot of the um, uh, more um, uh, angry bacteria survive. Uh, is there any investigation that you know that the immune system uh, upgrades better with homeopathy? Uh, <laughs> or you just... Uh, well, there, are, there is some evidence, uh, which I will talk about tomorrow, uh, where, based on immunological models, which show that you can modulate, at least modulate, switch on or off the immune system with, with, immu with, with homeopathy. But uh, as for the, I don't think so, not precisely show changes in the immune system. Um, and we don't know that it acts on, some of, the, some of the evidence suggests that it does not act on the, system, on the level of the immune system, but actually intracellularly. Uh, that's actually the biggest question we, we, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow, but you can show in some in vitro studies modulation of immune reactions. Peter, uh, Stephen Gordon, ECCH, thank you for one of your inimitable presentations. And I'd like to pay a tribute to Peter. I mean, I've been around about as long as, or even about the same time as Peter. In can't be longer, Stephen, can't be longer. Couldn't yeah, possibly. Yeah, and, and I have to say that this guy, his constancy, his... His incredible enthusiasm for homeopathy never wanes, even though he, he gets tired by all this sceptic stuff. My question is this, Peter. In the light of those incredible inconsistencies in the Shang, Shang report, why aren't you calling for retraction? I mean, there, there have been a number of high-profile uh, retractions from the Lancet in, recent, in the last year or so. It would seem to me this, if we could get that retracted, and uh, you know, I mean, you, maybe you think it's impossible, but we should at least call for it. Uh, it would be a huge spoke in the wheel of this skeptic attacks that we get. Why aren't you calling for retraction? 
Well, I mean, I think probably, as you say, it would be impossible and would be unpleasant and would, would cause a lot of anger. But yes, one could do it. I mean, one would, I mean, uh, you know, we, I have, the letter I, the letter I published had 36 signatories. Um, and actually there was another, you may remember, in, in the British Medical Journal about two years ago now which you know, said anybody who practices or researches homeopathy is a quack or a pseudoscientist. We had 48 signatures. I, was the, I recruited 48 people from 12 different countries, all from academic institutions or you know, public health hospitals, public hospitals. So you can muster that. And we could, I mean, I, I just sort of think, is it worth the effort? I don't think it would happen. I think it would be a huge amount of vitriol and unpleasantness and yes, Perhaps we should. <laughs> Thank you very I just, much. It just, just makes me feel tired to think of it, frankly. Thank you very much. Thank you.